Thank you for having me back, George. Um, it's been some years since I visited NMUG, but um, Mac user groups are um, like home. I'm, of course, a Mac user, uh, but using social media means I have to be familiar with all the platforms and all the tools, which I'm sure you can relate is potentially overwhelming. That's my normal state of being. <laughs> uh, so just a little background on me. I'm an author of three books on social media. I'm a consultant, so I work with businesses and organizations. And I also am a university professor at at least two colleges currently, but currently writing curriculum for the entire state of California Community Colleges uh, program. This is a big growing field and I specialize in teaching people of all ages. I love technology, always have. And it was actually my grandmother that told me that computers were the way of the future. So for me, um, my computer mentor, she just turned 100 last month um, and still likes to tell me about all the computer maintenance that she does. And I <laughs> I'm amused because at this point, <laughs> she's still talking about it at 100. So she's on top of it. But that's where my background comes from. So my um, goal today is to talk about tools that you're already familiar with, but talk about them through a lens of uh, features that you might not know exist. Um, and I kind of wanted to flip the rock over and show you some things you might not know and try and help you find ways to use these tools that, yes, can be frustrating, can be overwhelming, and can be negative. I'm a Pollyanna. So for me, I look for beauty. I look for art. I look for education. I look for inspiration. Uh, these tools are very much tools, like any other tool you have available to you, whether it's a graphite pencil, it is a shovel, it is a, um, a palette for your paints. These tools do what you ask them to do. Um, and there's a lot that you can do with them that is not promoted in the news, that's not talked about. Uh, we as humans tend to be drawn to and want to talk about negativity. There is a tremendous amount of inspiration, art, and beauty. And I want to show you some of those features that you might not know about to enhance the quality of your life. It is actually possible, I promise. So um, I'm definitely animated and excited. And if we were all in a physical room, I, there's often dance moves that I, go, <laughs> that I put with these because, um, again, I am looking for the beauty and the light. And I want to show you some fun things that I think will help you, again, see the world slightly differently. So let me share my screen and we will talk about three different tools that are um, appropriate for this particular conversation. Now, I work with people of all ages, literally five to 105. So understanding how people use technology differently is really important. One size does not fit all. And I went through this thinking about what might be useful for you, um, your life and your interests. So social media in and of itself, it, again, is a tool. Now, the great part about technology, as I just mentioned, it does our bidding. Having in mind some of the things that you would like to do, some of your goals, um, I would I challenge you to broaden some of the things that you can do. And I'll show you a whole bunch of examples of ways that you can use these tools that you might not have thought of. I did want to show you the top three reasons that people are using technology. Now, this is broken down by generation. Now, um, they don't generally collect data over the age of 64. I don't know why that is. Anything 65 and up is just lumped together. And in this particular um, graph, as I see regularly, they really don't track a lot of information about people over 65. Why? I'm not really sure. Um, but what I wanted to point out in the orange box is that baby boomers um, are primarily using social media to stay up to date with news and current events. Um, I live in Santa Rosa, an hour north of San Francisco. My community is the best read newspaper read community in the entire country. Knowing where you live, I know everybody here is potentially in a different location, which is one of the greatest parts about technology, plus the internet, plus Zoom. Um, 
is that we have the opportunity to see the world from a much um, farther view than we were able to before. So this is, of course, not to replace newspapers or any traditional form of media. It is an enhancement. Um, but uh, newspapers are being read physically, but they're also primarily being read online. And every news organization that you can imagine, every single one globally, is on social media. And they're on all of the channels. Uh, so I follow dozens of news organizations. I'm 44, by the way, which puts me solidly in Gen X. Um, I do tend to have some traits of millennials because I'm right on the line. Um, but I am technically too old to get social media. So I, I really would like to kick the word too old um, in the trash um, because I think it's garbage. Um, it really is about your spirit. I know that very much. Um, but uh, baby boomers are using it primarily to follow up with news. So whatever news organization you are interested in, whether it is local to you, whether it is regional, state, um, or it's international, seek them out. Um, I follow a tremendous amount of BBC news, but different countries because the perspective that you have is not the only perspective. It's really useful to get an international perspective of where you live as well. Um, the next, of course, is to stay in touch with what friends and family are doing. This is generally the dominant category, has been up till this point. Um, and then to fill up spare time. Your category, you guys have well-rounded uh, hobbies, so you rely on technology a little bit less than some of the other categories. Um, you also have a better perspective of life, right? So when my 15 year old daughter tells me she spends X amount of time doing something, I'm always blown away. And I go, oh, that's right. You don't have anything else to do with your life. <laughs> so understanding where people are in their lives helps us judge others less on how they use technology. Um, and that is really important because it'll change. But the news part is really important. And I do have to say, uh, critical thinking is something that was not taught. Um, again, I'm um, an American. Uh, critical thinking was not taught um, in a very efficient fashion, if at all, in K through 12 education. So we are unfortunately seeing the end result of a lack of basic civic and critical education. Critical thinking is really, really important. Who is releasing that information? What do they hope to gain? Why are they sharing it? When was this released? Some basic questions when you are reading a news source, um, making sure that it is a reliable news source and yet also asking critical questions is really important. It's important for every single person of every single age because social media is very shareable and poor, inaccurate, or negative information is too easily shared. In fact, Facebook is now releasing a feature that asks you this question. Have you read this article before you share it? That's really important that you read the article before you share it and you think critically. And truthfully, by the time you get to the bottom of an article, sometimes the author or columnist will go off the rails in the last couple paragraphs. So it's a really good idea to take your time and make sure that you know what you're sharing before you share it and that you think very clearly about it uh, because it's very, very easy to sway people with inaccurate information. And inaccurate information is far more um, um, visible. It is more dangerous than the truth and or factually and scientifically based information. That takes more time to get through so it doesn't get shared as easily. So slowing down and using your critical thinking skills has never been more important. Now, Facebook is used by 2.8 billion monthly active users. You are probably on Facebook or were at some point. There's potentially one person in this audience, maybe two, that hasn't used Facebook. Perfectly fine. You know what, truth be told, as a part of my job, I wouldn't use it if I could get away with it, but I don't have a choice. Much like a telephone. I actually have a telephone number only because I have to, not because I actually like the telephone. I wanted to show you an example of how many apps Facebook has. 
You don't need to use these. You don't even need to care about all of these. But I just wanted to show you for sheer breadth of coverage. So they have, of course, their main apps, Facebook itself, which is a social network, Instagram, which is also a social network that focuses on media, photography, videos. I'll talk about Instagram as the item number two in this presentation. Uh, Messenger, whether it's for kids, which I think is a terrible idea, um, is uh, designed for children, but it's a direct messaging, private messaging app. By the way, the word private is a completely false word, it doesn't exist. Uh, privacy in, um, I can only speak to the United States experience, uh, but privacy in the United States only existed for about 20 years. Um, it, we didn't have it before then and we don't have it now. So it is a false concept and we have to let it go. But if there is such a thing as private communication inside Facebook, they call that tool messenger. Um, WhatsApp is another tool, generally more international. Um, so these are the main stable of apps that Facebook uses. You might not know about some of these. Some of you uh, still have businesses or still working, run your own organizations and or donate your time to a historical society, a museum, wherever it is that you're spending your time and energy, you might be interacting with some of these apps that are business focused. Even though they're business apps, um, they're still necessary. I'm working with a library and a historic association, a historic society, and they're using these business tools, though they're nonprofits. So if you're not a person, then they call you a business. So give some flexibility with that wording. So these are some of the tools that they offer to businesses um, and organizations to uh, further their agenda, whatever it might be. And then we have even some more far flung way out in the tertiary um, uh, edge of the universe for Facebook um, portal, which looks very much like a tablet that can track you um, as you are talking. Uh, so it's video chatting. I have not actually seen one of these in practice, but they exist. Um, lots of other tools. IGTV is uh, for I, uh, Instagram television. It's a competitor to YouTube, which is the third tool that I'll talk about today. But IGTV is long form video um, run through Instagram. So all of these tools are excess tools that you may never see and may never interact with, but I just wanted you to get a sense for how many tools um, that Facebook offers. Now, these are only U.S. offered. There are other tools that are offered outside of the U.S. Um, that I was not able to access in the, um, the app library on my phone. Just to give you a sense of how much ground they cover. Again, 2.8 billion monthly active users. We call that MAU. And what that means is not accounts. It is in the last 30 days, 2.8 billion people have logged into Facebook. Now, there is always a misconception. And when I say always, since Facebook has uh, become popular, there is always the story that people um, are leaving Facebook. That is not the case. It's really never been the case. Um, everybody uses Facebook, no matter how old they are. The one thing that has changed is the time on site. So over the last two years, users have used Facebook four minutes less per day. So if there is a loss of use, it's in time spent on the website. Not that people are leaving promise. This is what all of the data shows. So your grandkids are there. Your kids are there. Your neighbors are there. Your colleagues are there. Your church is there. Your friends are there. They are there. How much time do they spend on the site? That's a different story. I wanted to map out a basic understanding of Facebook because this is a misconception that happens over and over and over again. This is a constant explanation that I have to give. So it's just kind of built into every Facebook presentation that I give. Facebook users um, are required to only give four pieces of information. One, your legal name, um, your email or phone number. They need some way to communicate with you. Um, your gender. They do have 56 genders. So if 
you are in the binary, fantastic. If you're outside of the binary or somebody in your family is or a friend, they can change their gender. That is not as easy as you think. Um, you can um, Google how to change your gender on Facebook. It happens to be my second most popular blog of all time, basic tech support. Um, but the fact that there is a need and a desire to change your gender, if you choose to, that's an option. And your legal birth date. Most people fudge on this and that's understandable. What they need that information for is they want to make sure that you're old enough that they can market alcohol or tobacco to you. That's really why. Um, also, they are legally required to not um, interact with anybody under the age of 13. Child Online Privacy Protection Act, known as COPPA. All social media channels are required to not communicate with children under the age of 13, which makes me wonder how that messenger for kids and the potential Instagram for kids works. Hmm, I'd have to get into the terms and conditions and figure out how that's even legally possible. But if you have anybody in your family, um, grandkids, that kind of thing, that are using any social media tool and they're not 13, that's a conversation you might want to have with their parents um, if you're concerned about it. I know my parents are always talking to me about what my sister does with her kids, um, thinking that I'm going to police her, which I don't do. Um, but I just wanted you to know, um, again, my 15 year old was really worried about her friends when she was around 11, that her 11 year old friends had Twitter, which is absolutely frightening. Uh, but there's a reason that law is in place. Um, so again, they want to make sure that you are over the age of 13, that they can alcohol, they can market alcohol or tobacco products to you. That's what they're really looking for. Um, again, you have to use your legal name. And why is that? Um, it's because 2.8 billion people are using Facebook every month, right? So law enforcement is regularly using uh, Facebook and all of its tools to track down illegal behavior. So that might be somebody that, um, that is arrested for a DUI or a violent uh, spree. They wanna see what that person's doing. It's very common that people leave evidence on their Facebook profile. So um, Facebook is trying to remove themselves from the process of interacting with law enforcement. They wanna make it very, very easy for people that are guilty or dangerous um, to be identified. And so the legal name is one of the first steps. Many of the rules that Facebook has are based on what MySpace did and what MySpace did wrong. Um, so that legal name is really just so you can be tracked um, and that if you are, if you break a law that we can easily point you out. Um, you may only have one account and what qualifies as one account is you have an email address or a phone number and a password. That's an account. If you have more than one account and or are using a name that is not legally yours or very close derivative, some people will use a nickname um, and can get away with it, Facebook will shut your account down. It's in the terms and condition or the terms of use, whichever they're calling their um, initial, um, I agree to this before I sign up to use Facebook. Of course, you didn't read those terms and conditions because it's physically impossible to read them all. Um, but ultimately, if you break one of those rules, they will chuck you off of their site. Absolutely. Um, so people complain about that, but that's what happens when we aren't informed about the services that we're using and the requirements that they give us. Um, you cannot impersonate anybody and you must be human. That rule doesn't apply on Twitter, as an example. The Brooklyn Zoo had a boa constrictor that got out um, a couple years ago and they created a Twitter account named after the boa constrictor. So in that instance, it's a non-human entity. You also cannot create an account for a local restaurant that's a really common use that I see that violates this basic rule. Um, so hopefully we're not doing any of those things, but if you are, it potentially your account could be shut down. And if you are volunteering your time and you are participating to post for any organization through their Facebook page, if you violate any of those four basic rules, um, you are putting that page at risk. And that page could be shut down or locked up because you aren't following the rules. 
Now the center of this diagram shows you as the person, you have an account, you have friends. The average person has about 350 friends. Um, and that is a reciprocal relationship. You have to give permission for that person to interact with you and see your content. You also have the opportunity to join groups. Those are generally based on hobbies or interests. Um, you have the opportunity to interact with pages or run pages. Every single person that has a profile, profiles have friends, um, has the opportunity to be an administrator of a page. There's no way of knowing, there's no way of accessing your personal profile from a page, which those red arrows are demonstrating for you. So I can access a page and be an admin of the page, but there's no way a fan or somebody that likes that page can figure out that I am the administrator. And I give you the examples such as Target or Coca-Cola or Doritos, doesn't matter what brand or company that you're thinking of. If you go to their Facebook page, there is no way for you to know who it is that is running that page. Um, I work with government and educators uh, regularly, and they are very, very nervous, understandably so, that somebody will figure out who's running that page and then it will reflect on them and that they'll get harassment. That is not the case. It's built that way on purpose. So the different features, of course, I've mentioned most of these. Um, the one thing I want to mention to you about your profile that I haven't already said is that you can't do business on your personal profile. And the category of person that I see that violates this the most is real estate agents. Um, they're regularly showing their listings on their personal profile. And there's something that we call a social contract. And that social contract is you're my friend. You're not going to try and sell me something. And that is also on Facebook. Uh, so if you uh, sell candles or tooth whiteners or timeshares, it doesn't matter what you're trying to sell through your personal profile, you are upsetting your friends. And we don't have the vocabulary or the communication skills to tell you that you're upsetting us, but you can ruin relationships by doing that. So if you have business to take care of, do it on a Facebook page. Um, so Pages are, of course, public on the internet with no maximum on fans, and that's where you advertise. This is the place that I wanted to focus on for you inside Facebook is the group feature. Groups are really fantastic and is probably the most positive place inside Facebook. They're investing a tremendous amount of money and time into making sure this space is healthy and good for everybody involved because you have the opportunity to find people that are like you, that are interested in what you are interested in. Um, I'm a technology person. Not only am I interested in hardware, I'm interested in artificial intelligence and uh, drones and um, AR and VR and MR, mixed reality, virtual reality, augmented reality. I'm interested in programming. I'm interested in marketing. I'm interested in so many different things that they aren't all going to be in one space. So NMUG is a fantastic example of a group that you belong to of a particular interest. Now, you have lots of interests as a human being. So I encourage you to ask your friends I'm looking for a space to do X. Do you have any recommendations on where I can find people like that inside Facebook? Ask your friends. It's a great way to find highly vetted and customized to you because your friends know you really well. Just like movies or books or food or restaurants, your friends are gonna have some suggestions that are customized for you, knowing what you like and what you're about. Groups can't are equitable in the fact that everybody has the chance to talk. It isn't the same as a page where the page has one voice and everybody listens to it. This is a circle of chairs and everybody talking amongst each other. Um, there's no advertising here. So it is a, a very a conversationally information based space. Um, and I just think they're fantastic. They can be connected to a page. I happen to have a marketing group attached to my Carrie Rigo consulting page designed for students that have gone through my classes 
or fellow marketers like myself so we can jam on really complex topics and talk about things that maybe we don't have answers to. Okay, so there's two different ways to look at groups. Public, anybody can see it in search, anybody can join. Private, there's two different uh, types of private. Private, that we can find the group in search, but you can't see any of the content until you are approved to be in the group. So you have to request to enter the group, and then um, you are able to see everything inside, the people and the posts. Then there is a hidden version, a really, really private version of a Facebook group that does not show up in search. So basically somebody has to give you the, the secret knock. They have to send you a link and invite you personally, but there's no other way for you to find that group. So that's something to know about. Again, the word private is false. So anything that you post on the internet, you should be comfortable with talking about in a court of law. <laughs> that's kind of my final litmus test. Um, this is one of my favorite groups. Um, I live in Sonoma County and our north is San Francisco. Beautiful country, beautiful place to be. Um, and temperate weather all year round. So I'm a beginning intermediate hiker and I just stick to the places that I know. This particular group, um, most of them have, all of them have an about. They will tell you what the group is about. You can see who's a part of it. This one has 5.9 thousand members. Um, it is private, so I did have to ask permission to come into the group. But they're showing things like trails and how to get rid of ticks. And every single weekend, people are raising their hands and saying, hey, I'm pregnant or I have a bad knee or I'm losing my balance. Should I use a walking stick? And people will trade the tools that they use and how to clean their backpacks and what's a great trail guide. It's a never ending list of amazingly useful things to help me up my game, to inspire me to get outside. And then when it boils down to it, beautiful photography. Um, so being a Mac user, photography, we have a leg up on some of the others because our tools are better. So I am a lover of nature photography. So if nothing else, I just get to enjoy the beauty around me through the perspective of another person. I've made hiking dates with people locally that I have lost touch with and said, hey, I see you're in the group. Let's go hiking. So this is a, a great example of beauty, education, community, um, like-mindedness, um, uh, product recommendations. So this is my favorite group. I have lots of groups that I'm in for a variety of reasons, um, but this one I wanted to share with you. All right, so get into groups. Again, ask your friends on Facebook, just put a post out that says, Hey, I'm looking to join groups that have to do with X, nature, art, hobbies. Give me some suggestions and people will tell you what they think you'll like. It's going to be a great way for you to get personalized recommendations to get you outside of your rut and have you enjoy this tool a whole lot more. And just like any other tool available to you, turn it off when you don't want it and it's out of your face. So let me switch to Instagram. Now, Instagram is what I call the golden child of the internet. This is sitting in the sweet spot of people of all ages enjoy this tool. If you haven't tried Instagram yet, I highly recommend you download the app on your smartphone. I'm going to assume you use an iOS device, that you're using an iPhone, you might not be. Um, but what's important to know about Instagram is that this particular tool is what we call mobile first. It is the first social media tool that's built for your phone. In fact, you can't use its full functionality from the desktop. So my Instagram, of course, is sitting there on my phone and it is built to exist in the phone environment. So this tool, 
um, thankfully is more intuitive than say something like Snapchat, which is specifically designed to exclude what they call quote unquote old people. So that is an exclusionary app. It does not want us there. <laughs> this tool is for everybody. Now the basic design of Instagram, again, is inside your phone vision. Um, I have an eight plus, so um, you should see, it should look the same no matter what model you have. On a tablet, on an iPad, no, on a phone is what you need to use this on. So the bigger phone you have, the more enjoyable the experience is, promise. Again, I have an 8 Plus. I'm about to upgrade to the 12 Pro Max. Um, so I'll get an even bigger screen and I'll enjoy it even more. But there are what I call five neighborhoods inside Instagram. The feed goes up and down. The stories go left to right. Um, the direct messages, of course, quote unquote private. Um, there is reels, which is uh, just video on a loop. And then there's shopping. So the shopping section, they're putting a lot of effort into, but the feed are static images. And when you scroll on your phone, um, it goes up and down. It's in not in chronological order. It's in order of what you are interacting with. So the Joel, uh, the Joel Willis that you see at the top here, um, I interact with his content a lot. So that post shows up number one in my feed because they know that I'm already very interested in his content. Instagram does not hide content. It just reorders it by order of priority based on your behavior. Um, so stories at the top is designed a little bit for the younger person, the person that's familiar with Snapchat or something of that nature. Stories are what we call ephemeral messaging. Ephemeral means that it disappears. Um, it only lasts for 24 hours. This is a psychological design to get people to come back again and again and again. You really don't have to use stories if you don't like them or don't want to. Um, I use the feed just fine, it's lovely. Um, but you can skip the stories if you want to, promise. Reels, that might be something you wanna try with your grandkids. It's a great way to bond, right? You've got Easter dinner, you've got Mother's Day, you've got the 4th of July and they wanna teach you a little shuffle um, or they wanna do a joke with you. Um, it's a really fantastic way to bond with your grandkids, I promise. Um, and I'm gonna show you an example of how I bond with my family members. So I'm gonna show you a few different ways that you can use Instagram that you probably had no idea. So I stay in touch with my family, just the same way I would on Facebook. On the left is the account of my cousin, Brendan, and he is a world traveler. And we could never track him. And every holiday, somebody would say, have you seen Brendan? What's he up to? And I'd say, let me pull up his Instagram. Let me show you where he's at. He used to use Facebook, but Instagram he preferred. So no matter where he was in the world, I could share with my grandmother or my parents where my cousin was. He's a little more settled now, he's in his mid 30s, so he doesn't travel as much, but he still is very outdoorsy, so I get to see what he does for a living. And that's a really fun example. Now, the one on the right is my goddaughter, who of course doesn't use the phone, doesn't keep the same phone number, so I can't really text her. If I wanna reach her, I reach her on Instagram. And this is a private message between the two of us, it's a stream. Um, so I wished her a happy birthday on her birthday. And then one day I saw a post from her mom, my best friend, um, that talked about she was so proud of her daughter. So rather than ask my best friend what happened, I went to this direct message and asked my goddaughter, what did you do that has your mama so proud? I wanted her to talk about it and I wanted us to connect. So she told me what she was up to and I got the chance to bond with her and interact with her. So communication is about how can you connect with people however you prefer to communicate with people is your preference but if you want to reach another person please consider what their preferences are i don't necessarily want to talk to her via instagram dm but that's really the only way i can reach her and she's my goddaughter so i'm going to do whatever i can to stay a part of her life and to also make sure that that communication is open 
Should she need me, she knows she can reach me. So stay in touch with your family. Whatever art or hobbies that you have, um, is, this is a fantastic place. Instagram is actually the center of the art world. I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. Instagram is the center of the art world. So Creative Sonoma is an organization that supports artists. So it has a really broad view of art in my community. Now, Shahuli, I love blown glass. It's my favorite form of art. And I'm sure every single one of you has seen a Shahuli piece, Dale Shahuli. He's got an eye patch. So he's memorable if you've ever seen his face. I saw a PBS documentary on him 15 years ago, working with underprivileged kids in Seattle, teaching them how to blow glass. And I've been following him ever since. But his pieces are featured in the Bellagio at Las Vegas. They're all over the world, um, huge glass pieces. and. I'm not going to travel to see his art. I'm just not. They're huge installation pieces. Um, but I get to see every piece he makes in the best quality photography because I not only follow the artist, but I follow his organization. I follow the gardens. I follow two or three different accounts. I have a friend that is an even deeper friend because she had a Shiholi poster in her office. And I went, oh, and she's like, yeah. So I knew right away that we were destined to be friends. So whatever artists that you are passionate about, whatever museums you want to go to, there are dozens of museums in this world that I will never visit. But guess what? I get to see their exhibits and their people anytime I want. And by the way, the Louvre in Paris, their Instagram account's really boring. I saw an article once that said the 50 best museums on Instagram. And I went through and I looked at every single one of them and my soul felt filled. How you feel when you use social media really matters. Listen to your gut. Now, cooking and food, great example. So on the left um, is Chef Chris Cho. He is a Philly based uh, Korean chef. So he has this really cool Philly style, um, but he cooks traditional Korean food. And he's a young guy and he has this great delivery. Um, so I really enjoy listening to him, but I also am learning a tremendous amount about Korean food. I love all Asian cuisine, um, but understanding how to cook it. I am not Asian, I'm part black, part Irish. So this is not something that is in my family. Um, and I don't know anybody that cooks Asian style food. So I have no opportunity to learn this, but every single time I see a post from him, I sit and watch it. I learned um, the third tile on his is how he made steamed egg. And he showed how his grandma made it and then how you can make it if you don't have all of the traditional uh, tools, the steamer baskets and all of that. So he shows you the traditional version and then he shows you a modified Philly version. Um, so it's amusing, it's fun, and I'm learning a lot. And I'm also learning basic cooking skills that are there, they go from culture to culture. So what he's making, right, it's Korean, but it's also not, it's universal. On the right, I did a search. If you look at the bottom of the screen, it has a magnifying glass. The magnifying glass, by the way, this is the uh, navigation bar. Instead of navigation bars being up top, like they are on the desktop, uh, Instagram has adapted and made the navigation bar at the bottom because if you're holding your phone, and when you hold your phone, your thumb is at the bottom of the screen. So they put the navigation bar at the bottom because that's where your thumb is. So if you get confused about where the buttons are, they're at the bottom of the, the Instagram screen. That's why, because of the way your phone is held. So the magnifying glass is the discover, it's the explore section. And I put in the phrase canning. Here's why I put in canning. Because if you have a garden, like I do, every year zucchini season comes around and I have more zucchini than I know what to do with. Tomatoes too. And then I go looking for recipes on what do I do with all these tomatoes? What do I do with all of the zucchini? So um, I looked up canning because it's about time for stuff to start coming out of my garden. Um, so I have the opportunity to subcategorize whether it's garlic or beef or recipes. 
I would look for tomatoes. <laughs> um, this is going to give me lots of different examples of how I might can, right? You might have somebody that's electric. You might have somebody that is off the grid. You might have somebody that's vegan. You might have somebody with other dietary concerns. So whatever variation you want, or you just like the style, the way somebody says it here versus this one. This is an example of all of the things that came up just in the first scroll of things that have to do with home canning. So anything you wanna learn in cooking or food, there's somebody times 10 that can teach you how to do it. Whether it's a local event, it's a resource or a location, I am a huge reader, I'm really into education. So I'm passionate about my local library and I'm very familiar with the services that my library offers because as an educator, I want to make sure that not only do people know that it exists, but they know that it's free. So the having equitable solutions for people of all um, economic levels is really important. So whatever resources you have in your community, most likely they have an Instagram account. They really do. How do you find their Instagram account? You can look in that magnifying glass and type in the name of the organization. Another way to do it is to visit their website and they're going to have social buttons on their website. Now, not every website's up to date. So sometimes they don't have their Instagram on there, um, but it is quite easy to search for them in the magnifying glass. It's a general search section. And as you can see in the right screen, um, I typed in the word hiking and um, I chose the filter instead of top hits or accounts that have the word hiking in it or things that are tagged with hiking, I chose places. So these are um, geo pins that people have tagged a location where I can go hiking. So this kind of supports my hiking over on Facebook. Um, this allows me to look at different places that I haven't thought of before. And this, if I were to choose any of these, I will see pictures from all different perspectives, 360 degree views in all kinds of weather so that I can get a really good sense visually if this is a place I wanna visit. This with the library as well, I'm a fan of the library everywhere, but I talk to the library back and forth. We converse about things, I'll ask questions. And um, Instagram accounts often answer faster than Facebook accounts do. So you can have a more intimate conversation with any brand you follow on Instagram. You're more likely to hear from them faster than anywhere else. So whether it's history or activism, um, I follow lots of different organizations that I support with my dollar, with my support, by sharing their content. ACLU is one example. Um, there's so many different types of organizations that might be important to you. This is a way of keeping tabs on what's important to them and what they're fighting for. Um, history, fantastic way to reminisce and to feel nostalgic. Um, I have so many different history accounts that I follow um, that it's really important for me. Again, I'm in my mid 40s. A lot happened before me. So we are now resurrecting a tremendous amount of archival photography. We're uh, restoring a lot of photography. So whatever you're interested in, whatever you want to look back on, there is a history account dedicated to that. And I highly encourage you to search in that magnifying glass, search for whatever you're interested in, and you will find accounts that, um, that suit your fancy. Culture and people. There is a massive uprising of education and information around Indigenous peoples throughout the world. And I feel honored and gives me goosebumps to be able to learn about people that did not have a voice before. Their voice was continuously silenced. This gentleman, James, I don't even remember, I think it's James is his first name, but Notorious Cree is his handle, um, handle very much like CB Radio. He became very popular on TikTok, which is very similar to Instagram. Um, Instagram has a broader reach though. 
um, he is also on TikTok and he is regularly uh, featured in media around the world because he's such a great educator for his culture. Um, and then he'll feature somebody and then I'll follow them. So I'm learning about different indigenous nations around the world through Instagram. It is beautiful. And it is one of my favorite parts of Instagram. So yeah, you can follow celebrities, but why? when there's so many other rich things you can look at. Okay, so let me touch on hashtags real quick because this is a common question. It's a metadata tag is really what it is. It's a way for us to find information. So very similarly in your iPhoto library, if you were to search for a person's name or a type of content, it will filter that content and then show you what you want. Hashtags work exactly the same. Um, generally, when you are on a search engine like Google or Bing and you type in canning, um, you're going to find all kinds of search results that have to do with canning. As I showed you when I looked up canning and Instagram, um, hashtags work inside social media platforms. Keywords work everywhere, but hashtags, when you search for them, it's the same concept. Um, it has the pound sign in front of it. Um, if you use those inside a search, inside a social environment, then you're going to get the information just from inside that social environment. Keywords are general, they work everywhere, um, but hashtags work inside each closed garden. Generally, Instagram and Twitter is where you want to use them. You don't want to use them on Facebook. Facebook users can't stand them. Here are some examples of how they're used, um, whether it's wine or canning. Um, whether it's a brand such as Corbell Winery or Nike, whether it's real-time events such as the Olympics or an election or the Oscars. That's a fantastic way to track what people are talking about in real time. And that was really hashtags first use was real time connection. So if you're all watching the Super Bowl, you can talk to your fellow Jets fans uh, or, you know, <laughs> uh, Packers fans about that particular sporting event while it's happening. And you may never have met that person before, but you guys are really excited about that pass that just happened. So it's a great way to plug into people and like you're in the stands, talk to each other and fist bump and do all that good stuff. Um, location is a fantastic way to broaden your horizons within whatever location you're in, especially if you're traveling. Oh, such a great idea if you're traveling. Put in the name of the city or the region and you'll get information in a way that you wouldn't get from a travel guide. You get it from a person on the street. Um, and then subtext. Sometimes they are used not for search, but just so you know how I feel. It's kind of like a parenthetical reference or um, like when you read a play and you get stage direction, um, you get some understanding of how the actors are feeling. It's the same, um, it's the same drive, it's the same intent. Not really for search, just want you to know how I feel. Here's a couple don'ts. Hashtags are all one word, they're all smushed together. So if you um, put in two words in a space, the hashtag will only be I'm instead of I'm old. I'm really talking about myself here. Um, and I don't subscribe to the concept of being old. I think it's kind of dumb, um, but um, you know, people say it all the time in relation to social media. No characters, no numbers. So this apostrophe that I've thrown in there totally destroys the, the hashtag. Hashtags will turn a color. They'll turn blue like a regular link so that you can see what the hashtag is. Um, the great thing is on Instagram is that you can edit a hashtag because people misspell them all the time. So you can always go in and edit a hashtag if you've written it and you realize, oh, there's an extra letter in there. I mean, you can fix it. So just think carefully where you use them. Ultimately, don't use them on Facebook. That's really the place that nobody wants them. They do exist. They functionally work, but Facebook users despise them. So just keep that in mind. All right, the last one, YouTube. You might think of this as only a music place, but there's a lot of features that exist on YouTube that you might not know about. 
So um, I'm on youtube.com on the desktop and I clicked on the explore tab on the left side. Yours might be designed a little differently than mine. Um, that's pretty common. Um, but the explore tab is giving me ideas for different types of content that I might be interested in. So music is its number one use. Its number two use is education. So here are some examples of ways that you might use YouTube but I wanted to show you some real things I've actually looked up. How to shuck an oyster. My husband was um, trying to open oysters and I, he is hospital prone. This man can damage himself with a pencil. So as soon as I recognized he was about to hurt himself, I told him to stop what he was doing. I picked up his, my phone and I Googled how to shuck an oyster. YouTube videos, by the way, YouTube is owned by Google. So YouTube videos show up very highly in Google search. Um, they purchased YouTube, Google's number one uh, search engine. YouTube is the number two search engine in the world. So if you learn by video, think about YouTube. Um, whether you wanna learn how to juggle or you wanna learn how to play guitar from one of the most talented guitar players in the world. This is Tom Morello um, from Rage Against the Machine. He's also a Harvard educated poli sci major, very active in politics and activism, also happens to be a wicked shredder on the guitar. Um, this was his masterclass, which is a very popular platform, very professionally done. Um, he is truly amazing. So I looked up how to play the guitar and got all kinds of results, but I looked up the most well-known guitarist I could think of and learn how I can play, learn how to play guitar from him. That's a, that's like a once in a lifetime, nobody gets to do that type of thing. So no matter what it is you want to learn, whether it's um, an emergency, it took me 30 seconds to find a video to teach my husband how to shuck an oyster so he didn't hurt himself, or it's something you've always wanted to learn, or it's something that you need to learn better and you want to learn it from the pros, doesn't matter what you want. Education is their number two category. This is a live stream of the jellyfish at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. They had one for otters, but there were actually no otters in the shot. So I chose this one instead. It's also a fundraiser. It's showing um, that there, there is a $1,957 currently in the, in the fund for this particular donation fundraiser. There's a chat here, there's a description. So whether you're into penguins or giraffes or wildebeests or jellyfish, um, if there is an an animal or a being or an idea of something that you want to interact with, there is a live stream. They call them live cams. Um, there is a whole category for this so that you can see something in real time. I'm telling you, there is something to be said about watching puppies in doggy daycare that will change your attitude for the whole day. <laughs> so take a look at the live cams and see if there's anything in there that turns your frown upside down. Movies and shows. This is great if your grandkids come over or you have friends over and you want to see something in particular. Yes, I use Netflix and I use Amazon, um, but you can also access them on YouTube, of course, which is accessible on any device that you have. You can purchase movies as well. Um, but they have pretty much any movie that you could find in any other location. So it's another option. They're also television shows. So if you haven't seen a show like The Honeymooners or Seinfeld or whatever it is that you're into, I did a search for a senior living community and I showed Felix the Cat. They had it at the time, it was called YouTube Classics, but now they have it here in movies and shows. So that if you want to show your grandchild the cartoon that you liked when you were younger, Felix the Cat, they had all of them on YouTube. So it doesn't matter if you haven't seen it in a really long time. If there's something that you'd like to see again, you're most likely going to be able to find it on YouTube. So I wanted to see if you had any questions for me, the rest of the time we have available is to answer questions. Okay. Barbara, can you unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Yeah. Uh, I just was wondering if uh, Carrie had any hunch 
about whether the over 64, uh, which is not measured uh, age group has, is similar to the 64 and under or have a different set of concerns. One that came to mind was health. Yes, um, they, the, the data that I have seen is it's very similar, which is why they tend not to measure, one of the reasons that they tend not to measure. It isn't vastly different. Um, it's also a much vaster audience that's harder to categorize. Health is a concern, um, but it doesn't show up on any, as a, as a standalone category, health does not show up in any report that I've seen as a high priority. It's just not, it's just not tracked, it's not seen, it doesn't show up in the data. Otherwise, they're fairly similar, though, the under 64 and the over 64. They really are very similar. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Frank, can you unmute yourself and ask one of your many questions? Oh, I have many? Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I noticed uh, movies and shows has a purchased option. I didn't see a free option. So is this another movie purchase site? The screen that we were in, the, the, there was two tabs. And the first tab, um, it does actually show free lower down, Frank. I just wasn't able to get all that in the shot. Okay, good So enough. the screen that we were on, because I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the free before I'm going to the purchase, always. So the screen we were on was free, and there are lots of free options in there. But you can also purchase, like if you want to watch Wonder Woman 1984, which is a very new movie, you can right. purchase that as well. Big mix of both. Okay, so, uh, and, and if, I mean, <clears throat> I don't want free with commercials. Ah, I haven't seen a commercial in five years. Well, gosh darn, that's amazing. So the way media generally works as a field is if you don't pay, somebody's got to pay. And that's where advertising comes in. So it's an either or. If you want new commercials, you're going to have to pay. Now, um, I can't say if for sure if they don't have commercials. It's YouTube, which is their money. Google is made entirely from advertising. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a safe guess that there will be some um, ads in there because that's the way YouTube rolls. Um, but I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, yeah, so free equals advertising pretty much there as a rule. There's a YouTube Plus subscription that eliminates commercials. Here it is. It's called YouTube Red. I did oh, not red. bring that one up only because I didn't feel I the odds of anybody here wanting to spend eleven ninety nine a month on YouTube Red I just didn't see that as a blip on the <laughs> on the meter. But yeah, there is a possibility you can absolutely use the YouTube Premium service. I think it's eleven ninety nine a month, um, and you have a lot of options. Mm -hmm. Yes, we actually have several people here who use YouTube Red. That's wonderful. I don't know anybody <laughs> that actually pays for it. So, okay. All right. Thank you, Frank. Marsha, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, yes. Hi. I have a Facebook question as far as privacy. I know what you, you said is kind of a joke, but I have, it used to be on Facebook as far as who could see you only, it said only me. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't anymore. It's it says- under custom. Okay, but let's say you really don't want anybody to find you, but you wanna be on Facebook to see your grandchildren. How yes. would that work? So ultimately they don't really have that option unless you fill a couple requirements. If you want something to be only me, that generally means that you don't have any friends, which is kind of an, un it's an unrealistic expectation. Um, but for, in order for people to find you, um, your activity, who can see your future posts is one of them. Um, limit the audience for posts you shared with friends. They really, who can see your friends list? The only me option only appears in a couple different places. Um, they really don't want you to do that. I figured that out. Yeah. But you hear, yeah, you hear about all these college kids that obviously 
they don't know about not making their page public. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other day, the ones at University of Massachusetts, I don't know if you saw that, three girls had their picture taken without masks mm -hmm. uh, off campus, and now they're expelled. Well, I'm just wondering where that picture came from and why they didn't make it private. So maybe the they... thing about um, about privacy um, on Facebook, I have a thought and I lost it, and hopefully it will come back to me. <laughs> I lost it. What was mm -hmm. it? <laughs> See, we can't call those senior moments. We can just call those human. Um, ultimately, the visibility is massive and they want people to be seen. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Um, younger generations, actually data shows are much more privacy conscious. The younger a person is, the more likely they are to use their privacy features. Um, we find a lot of dangerous behavior with people over the age of 50 because they aren't as well trained on how to use the services. Not to say that judgment doesn't come into play. Absolute judgment comes into play. So they may not have even taken that photo. Somebody else may have taken that photo and then uploaded it. And then because they were the subject yeah. of the photo, they got the ramifications. Um, and that's very common. If you are in public anywhere in the world, your photo is being taken and somebody is posting it. And that is the reality. Um, can you untag yourself if that yes. picture shows up? Okay. You absolutely can. And in your settings, you can say who can tag you. It is da, 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 da. privacy, profile and tagging is the feature um, that it's called. And if I share my screen, I'm in my personal settings on Facebook mm -hmm. and tagging. Who can see posts that you're tagged in on your profile? Uh, my friends can see that. Oop, look at that. Here's an only me. It isn't um, offered in every single option, but when you're tagged in a post, who do you want to add um, to the audience who can already see it? You get to review it. So mine is turned on. So if anybody tags me, I get to review it before it goes live. Okay. Yeah. Great. Sounds it like we need an yourself. entire, yeah, you need an entire lesson just on the Facebook settings. I teach a class that is uh, 12 hours on Facebook. Um, and we, oh still can't, we still can't reach everything. Yeah. All okay. right. Thank you, Thank you. Thank, thank you, Marsha. Wayne, Mert, your question, you're next. Wayne, are you there? All right, so Wayne's question is, if I have an interest in Tesla and there are 200 Tesla Facebook pages, what is the best method to filter through all and find the best one? Mm, I would go for the verified Tesla page. Um, the verified is going to have a blue check mark by it or depending on how Facebook does it today, there's some sort of designation that says verified. They change the, the logo. It's usually a check mark. I mm -hmm. would go with the original, um, the master account. Um, and then as you look at, I would Google, I would Google this information, best Tesla fan account. And then you will get um, a combination, go for a, a vetted source, somebody you trust, let's say it's a car and driver magazine. Um, and they list the 10 best Tesla resources. Go with a reputable source that is going to do the recommendation for you. Facebook's filtering system is very poor. Um, if you're gonna use Facebook's filtering system for this example, I would look for the group or page that has the most fans or followers um, or group members. That is a, a great sign. But I generally will look for the verified source inside Facebook I will ask a verified source in a search engine for their recommendation and or I'll look for the one that has the, the most reach. What is verified specifically supposed to mean? It's supposed to mean that Facebook literally has double checked and triple checked that this organization is who they say they are. Now, when it's a brand such as Tesla, that it is in fact Tesla, that they've confirmed that that is the brand so that it isn't impersonating the brand because that is a violation of intellectual property and trademark. Um, so Facebook is very sensitive to violations of intellectual property, about more sensitive than any other topic. Um, and so if you want them to do something, tell them it's violating a copyright or a trademark and they'll move. 
Um, okay. But Tesla would sue them if uh, they were serving content of some other brand or somebody was impersonating them. So that verification serves that purpose. All right, good to know. Alan, can you unmute yourself and ask a question, please? It, it's probably too much detail to go into the new privacy uh, situation with the latest iOS. But my simple question is, uh, by default, are we, uh, are we private or do we have to actually set up some kind of privacy thing uh, uh, under the new uh, Apple iOS system? You're gonna wanna go into your general settings. Um, you're gonna go into privacy and take a look at the privacy settings that you have for Facebook. Um, I would recommend doing that for any app that you use and do it as a regular maintenance practice. Uh, about once every six months, you're gonna want to look at whether it's your notifications or your privacy and your location services and double check and make sure every, every app that has access to that information you're comfortable with. But you're gonna go into general settings uh, privacy, and then take a look at your Facebook settings. So it is not oh, default. It's not default. So I actually have to, uh, if I do nothing, then, you know, it's just like I never had the privacy in place. So I have to actually Correct. physically put it in place. You sure do. And I highly recommend, particularly for Facebook, that um, each of you that uses Facebook is regularly, once every six months or so, that you go look at your settings, both in your mobile environment and on the desktop and make sure that the settings are, the privacy settings are what you like because they expand them and make it more complicated and they change things. So on a regular basis, just like you're maintaining any machinery in your life, whether it's your car, whether it's your heating and air conditioning system, you're going to want to do regular maintenance to make sure it's optimally performing. Facebook is no different than any other machinery in your life. It is up to you as the user to be informed and to make conscious choices about the way you're using it. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Frank, you had a question about censorship uh, regarding Facebook. Do you still have that question? And if Frank okay. doesn't, Go ahead, Frank. Go ahead. Yeah, I, uh, you know, there's a ton of controversy about the censorship activity of a corporation and the First Amendment. Now, someone said, well, because it's a private company, it doesn't have the authority, it doesn't have to obey the First Amendment. The First Amendment applies only to the U.S. government. The U.S. What? government may not censor you. Because Facebook is not the U.S. government, the First Amendment only applies to the actions of the U.S. government. Oh, was that uh, decided? Because I thought that every oh, human the being question. has the right to be expressing themselves. This is um, a fantastic opportunity to understand that we get very limited education around our Bill of Rights and our Constitution. Um, we get a very small intro to it and when you add technology or any new development or innovation, and then you apply it to our laws and rules, precedent isn't always applicable, right? There is new precedent continuously, but really the constitution is about the acts of the US government. I spend a tremendous amount of time paying attention to laws around uh, technology because it is a never ending conversation, it's constant. Um, but yeah, Facebook, does they they may not break laws, um, but those uh, those bill of rights that's really about the government what it may or may not do with citizens it doesn't have anything to do with private enterprise. Hmm. All right, thank you, Frank. Thank you. You're all right, uh, George, all yours. <laughs> I can't hear you, George. <laughs> Your face, I love it, George. Carrie, thank you very, very much. This was an outstanding meeting. And thanks for coming back to see us after all these years. My pleasure. And uh, stay well, and thank you so much. This is my um, contact information so that you can communicate with me should you have any questions. Um, I teach lots of Zoom classes as well. 
So if there's something you'd like to bone up on, we have that option, but my email address, my phone number, carryregoconsulting.com is my website. And thank you very much for having me today. Yes, uh, send that to me so that I can share it when I share the uh, video of the meeting. Okay, will do. Okay. okay. Uh, I guess everybody uh, can unmute themselves and thank uh, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Carrie. Fantastic meeting, Carrie. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Two thumbs up. This was the best. Hey, that's wonderful. Very informative and very entertaining. Thank you. Oh, good. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks.